Hey everybody, welcome back to our channel. Uh, we're here in the store today and we're gonna talk a little bit about Euphilia, but I thought we'd do something different today. We got Tommy. Tommy's a resident coral expert, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if I fire a couple questions away? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let's say I'm a new hobbyist and I'm and I'm finally starting to get my husbandry skills dialed in. I'm doing my water changes and I'm and I'm thinking it's time to try a piece of euphilia. You have a pointer, something something that would help me out, get me started on my path to success. I would definitely say probably your first coral for euphilia would not be a torch. No. I would think probably one of the either the frog spawns or the hammers. I just find that, you know, in, in a true mixed reef environment, if that's what it is, you know, it's easier to place and find a good spot where one of the two of those will do better than a torch because of the real estate that torches usually require. Do you think that's because of the, the tentacles and how far that they reach? Yeah, I mean, typically, I mean, even you can see in the way that we have this tank scaped with the way the corals are, I mean, all the hammers and the frog spawns are on this side. And you can see even, I mean, of course, there's going to be at night, you know, longer possible, you know, tentacles or whatever. But for the most part, you can see that even when they're fully inflated, I mean, you can see almost exactly how big they're going to get and what they can touch. Where on this side, I mean, some of the some of the tentacles on the torches, I mean, they're reaching out really far. And <laughs> pretty bad, right? I, I mean, it's bad with how grown these are, but the, the, the way that we combat that in this tank is the way that the flow is designed. It almost always forces them to go back. So Tommy makes a good point about the flow here too. I think one of the most common questions that I get about Euphilia is, how much flow do they need? And I think that this, the way that this coral is shaped and the way that it moves through the water column, I find that it looks like more flow than it really is. Yeah, and you can you can tell too that the way that this coral is receiving flow, it looks so much more dramatic. And when you look at like the leather, for example. Oh, for sure. And it's only another what, four or five inches away. And that is not rigid at all. No. You know, there's a little bit more rigid rigidity sure. to the coral, yeah. but I mean, you can see there's definitely a lot more that looks like it's passing over the torch. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about the hammers and frogs ones then. Do you think that they can handle a little bit more flow? I mean, more flow than what they're getting in this environment? Yes, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but again, I mean, the way that the way that the tissue is under the, you know, attached to the skeleton on all euphilia, it just, it just doesn't need that much current to, to open fully. I mean, if you, I mean, I've seen photos, you know, of wild colonies, you know, in the wild that it just goes massive, like they stretch for, you know, miles. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they're not getting that type of flow. Yeah, the, the word that I would use is they're just kind of tussling around. Let's say I've had a problem with my euphilia and it's not opened up in the last month, but it looked good for the first month that I had it. What would you look at first? I mean, it could be a number of things. I mean, for sure, I mean, like we were just discussing, flow could definitely be one. I mean, you know, perhaps for the first month, it it was it was holding on, you know, but it just gets to a point where it's just too much. I mean, it, I would definitely look at whether or not, I mean, you don't want it to be super direct flow. I mean, that's the first thing. I mean, if that's the way that you feel it in your tank is, then I would definitely either play with the flow or move the location of the coral. And then the second thing would just be pests. I mean, the, you know, Inevitably, you know, I mean, that's one of the worst in the in the hobby, you know, the euphilia flatworms, yeah. um, you know, and they're and they're sneaky, you know, I mean, a coral can look good for an extended period of time, even while dealing with that. And until you figure it out, they, you know, at that point, it's like it's too late. Yeah, I, I like I like talking about that because it's something that not most people are one trained to spot. 
Um, but then the other thing is too, it gives you that that warm and fuzzy because for the first month it was doing really Looking good. good. First it's that, and then second it's, I mean, you don't always think, but I mean, even like crabs and and shrimp, I mean, could potentially be, you know, or your favorite Nemo. <laughs> Right? Yeah, that's another big one too, for sure. How yeah. many times have you seen that happen? Yeah, clownfish is wanting the euphelia, the torches in particular, but any euphelia really to to host the clownfish. But clownfish are tough lovers. I mean, you know. Well, they, the the structure of the coral too makes it tough for the for the torch because underneath all that soft fleshy tissue is those really sharp, rigid coral icepta. You know, and it's like it acts like a knife. So when that that clownfish is grinding Probably. down on it, yeah. I mean, you see pieces of Floating, both yeah. tissue flow all over the place. For sure. So maybe we can talk a little bit about the lighting that they require. Yeah. Um, so in this tank, I mean, you can see. I mean, obviously the way. I mean, the structure that goes all the way up, and they're they're in. But I mean, it's it's definitely a lower lit tank. I mean, the lights are not super high. But they're very blue. But they're very blue. It's not a lot of intense white light. The intensity is not super high. Well, we do that for a couple of reasons here, specifically in this tank, because it's in the in the retail store. It looks really good. Euphilia in general look extremely good under white light, but they look even better under blue light for sure. Um, so because it's a showpiece inside of the store, we keep the, the lights blue for the majority of the day, and it's obviously proven success. Um, and for those of you who are interested in having this lighting profile, it's two Gen 5 blues on a 100.3. On a so that's 36 by 24. At our LED lighting preset tab on our website, we have this lighting profile. The Euphelia commands almost all of this tank, but there's also a lot of other corals in here that are doing well with this lighting profile. I mean, there's Monophora cap, there's mushrooms, there's some LPS back there, zoanthids, but I mean, they're all happy with the lighting schedule and the flow in the aquarium. I like that topic too, because a lot of times you'll see caps. Most general hobbyists think that it's an SPS and needs to be in high light. That's really not the case at all. So what do you think about the zoanthids? How do zoanthids do with, with philia? I mean, as long as, as long as they're not being touched by the euphilia, I mean, <laughs> I feel like down here, I mean, you can see, I mean, these are uh, awesome blossoms and blue lagoons down here that both look incredible all the way at the very bottom. And then in the back corner, there's also a big utter chaos colony and they look amazing because they're in lower light. So they get like that big, like almost nickel sized polyp with like a lot of definition in the, you know, when they're in higher light, they look really bright, but they lose kind of that that crazy speckled definition yeah. on the oral disc, so. In previous videos, if any of you watch, I use the term high energy environment a lot. This is not that. No. Um, so if we're to think in the wild about where they would be finding these types of coral, because we've created that environment, this is like the lower reef slope area. So you've got all those big crashing waves. You've got that really bright light with your acroporas, your leathers, your clams, you know, and then a few various other types of coral. As the, as the reef works its way away from shore, it's going to get deeper. And this is kind of like that second or third tier that you would find. Yeah. Where, you know, you're going to see a lot of lobos. You're going to see a lot of cash. So maybe a random acropora sprinkled in there. One that sure. decided it was going to want that. Um, but then even lower yet is some of your scolies. So that's something that we don't talk about enough is these corals don't really do good in most of your high energy environments because yeah. they're just, they're turbid water. They're very low on the lighting. Um, and a lot of times they're going to be found in like these little outcroppings of just individual pieces of coral. There's no protection around them. Yeah, for sure. You know, so stuff like that will do really good in the bottom of the euphilia tank. You can see in this, envi in this environment we have hammers and frog spawns touching. For the most part, uh, we found here that they, they can, right? Those, those two in particular right? mm -hmm. can, but all the torches are away on that side even certain torches like this is pretty amazing that we have all of these together with no problems yeah sometimes there is one or two torches that yeah. just don't don't they yeah. don't want to mix with the others yeah so it always takes a little bit of experimentation you know you can't always say 
definitively that all the torches can touch or all the frog spawns and hammers can touch. As a hobbyist, we buy a lot of times these single frags. And while it's easy to find where that one frag wants to be, we have to think about what it's gonna do as a, as a mature piece. For sure. So let's talk a little bit about how they grow. So when a, when a euphilia grows, let's say that it's a singular stalk. Over time, that one big polyp is gonna maybe, in certain cases, form a bigger oval and then kind of split in this sense. And then a lot of times what'll happen is there's tissue that'll form on the base and you'll get these little teeny tiny babies. Yeah. So the point, as it grows, it's growing up and out oh. at the same time because those little ones have to come up and look for sunlight. And what that means is the other ones are continuing to go up at the same time. So that's why you get these little bouquets, so to speak, of euphilia. So when you're buying a single frag, you have to almost think about, in a colonial form, what does it want? It wants to be kind of tucked in with all of its type, right? Because how delicate is that white tissue on the underside? For sure, yeah. It's just, but it is, it's just crazy because it really does kind of it grow, like you said, in two different ways. I mean, it's pretty cool that single large polyps pull apart and that's where you see that division of skeleton that allows for then, like you said, those little baby heads that then start to poke out. Mm -hmm. So what started as, you know, like your your point, is a small single head that's now the size of, you know, yeah. a small basketball. You know, I mean, it was just crazy. If you, if you really want torches, hammers, or frog spawns, you should really consider, one, creating an environment that's conducive to its health, For sure. or, or even just a part of your tank. And then two, trying different ones together because they definitely do better because they're a colonial animal in different patches. What about the tissue on the underside? That's the other big thing. I mean, a lot of times you'll you'll hear even, you know, hobbyist customers will come in and, you know, when they're purchasing, you feel they, they'll ask to see that underside of the, the you know, the, the coral because, you know, on a healthy euphelia, that, that, that white, tissue that grabs the skeleton will i mean it's pretty pronounced i mean on these aquacultured pieces i mean it definitely extends and it's very i mean it's very like thick and robust like it's really noticeable and that's where the babies are poking that's out. where the babies are poking yeah, yeah. point when you're buying a, a piece of euphilia make sure that that tissue extends down yeah. just a little ways yeah because the higher it is to the top crown of that the euphilia the higher the chances are that it peels back and it can actually come completely off of the skeleton. There's all these, I mean, all these torches and frogs and hammers that come out of our farm. I mean, like if you pull out of the water, it slimes up immediately mm -hmm. that underside and you should see like that very definitive tissue. Yeah, that's a survivable animal at that for point. Sure. 100%. If I was struggling with coloration on euphilia, what would I look for? I mean, I would probably first look at the nutrients in the water. Um, being a, a, a mixed reef like this, they definitely they definitely prefer a little bit of nutrient in the water, right? Like they don't want there to be zero nitrate or zero phosphate. Mm -hmm. So I think that that has absolutely something to do with it. And then I think just ties into just the, like we've been talking about the ideal environment, you know, like the, the, the right, flow, correct lighting. Because like we said, I mean, when we pointed out that one coral, you know, you can look at a lot of these torches and tell how dialed in and perfect the color is. In my mind, I have to think circumstantially. If it's not getting good color, look at its surroundings. Is everybody else that's the similar type of coral around it doing well? Well, then we don't look at water chemistry. It's not, it's that one, it's something with that one particular one. Yep. So possibly, the first thing I would probably do is change its location a little bit Dang somewhere it. else in the aquarium and see, you know, give it a little bit of time. How long? Know, at least a few days. I mean, I, I would say a week is probably a good period of time for the coral to readjust to where you moved it. You're talking to, about in size, though. A couple of days, it should be able to show to some respond size. more. Like if you were to say, "Oh, it's closed up," and I move it somewhere else, and it's a better spot, it should inflate more than it is here in a couple of things out and, and you can't expect the color to change a couple of no days. no no how long do you color. think that you would see that a couple of weeks maybe i mean you, you should notice a positive i mean corals will always tell you the answer you know i mean that's what's so cool about them sometimes is that like they they will tell you so if you move it from there to down here say 
and then a few days later we come in and it's all puffy it's telling you that it's responding well to the chain correct so i would go the same route with that if if my coral was all shrunk up and pale and all their corals around it of the same type are doing really well i would probably move it down into one lower light and two lower flow and to your point, the most astounding finding is going to be when that coral inflates bigger than it was, even though it's pale. Because if that inflates bigger, it tells you automatically that it's better than where it was. So chances are the color will come with it. I mean, if 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 I was coming into the store here and I was having trouble with my euphilia, those are probably the few most talked about topics. And I think the approach to get things back to the way that they should be is the answer rather than a specific parameter or a specific lighting schedule. Yeah, remember to always look like we talked about, remember to always look at the other corals. I mean, if it's just the one coral, that isolate the problem with the one coral. And when you're gonna try and troubleshoot problems, I usually, you know, when I talk to customers, I always tell them like, if you're gonna try and change variables, just change one thing at a time. And then give it some time to respond and see what the change is, if it's, you know, for the better or for the worse. And this isn't a game of luck either. You know, a lot no. of it's about consistency and understanding the changes that you make and what impacts that come along with them. But most directly, there's there's a lot of like one-off situations. There's outliers. You can always keep a torch in an acro tank, or you right. can always keep a, a, a blasto and really highlight, of course, of course, there's going to be those circumstances, but if we're talking about generally keeping a zone of corals together in one tank, this is a good combination. I mean, it's obviously euphilia dominated, but I mean, it really is catering to so many different species of coral and they're all thriving and doing really well. appreciate your time it was good chat it kind of just felt like we were kicking it yeah i mean it just feels like another day at the office for you and me just talking about corals well as always thanks a lot for watching guys we really appreciate all your support make sure to like comment and subscribe and we'll see you on the next one